March 11, 2011, 2.46 p.m. Just two Australians are still unaccounted for after the Japanese earthquake and tsunami. Okay, well, a uh, 7.9 magnitude earthquake uh, struck off the Japan's northeastern coast. Aid is pouring in now from all over the world, including American help for search and rescue teams. The earth beneath Japan began to tear itself apart. Buildings swayed like waves. Alarms blared. People screamed. And then, silence. For a moment, it felt like it was over. But what no one knew was that the true disaster was still forming, miles away, deep in the Pacific Ocean. What came next would become the deadliest tsunami of the 21st century. Entire towns erased, coastlines redrawn, thousands gone within minutes. But that was only the beginning. What really happened that day? To understand it, we need to go back in time to how it all started. March 11, 2011, 8 a.m., the day began like any other. In Tokyo, salarymen packed into subway cars. Office workers grabbed coffee from vending machines. In Sendai, university students attended lectures. Shops opened. Life moved forward. Along the Tohoku coast, fishermen prepared their boats. The morning catch had been good. None of them knew that in just a few hours, their world would end. We're looking at these pictures, we can see something is ablaze there on the ground as this very strange wave of mud and debris with boats included. 72 kilometers off the coast of Miyagi Prefecture, 24 kilometers below the seabed, two tectonic plates have been locked in a silent battle for over 1,000 years. The Pacific Plate, dense and heavy, diving beneath the North American Plate, subduction, a slow, grinding process. Centimeters per year. Pressure building. Stress accumulating. The plates weren't sliding smoothly. They were stuck. And when tectonic plates get stuck, energy accumulates, like compressing a spring. Eventually, something has to give. Seismologists knew this. They'd been warning about the big one for decades. The Miyagi coast was overdue for a megathrust earthquake. Models predicted magnitude 7.5, dangerous but manageable. They were wrong. 2.46 p.m. The fault line gave way, not in one place, but across a staggering 500 kilometers. The Pacific Plate lurched, slipped beneath the North American Plate. The seafloor jumped upward, six meters in a single instant. An area the size of the state of California was displaced in 90 seconds. The energy released? 600 million times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb. Magnitude 9.1, the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan. The fourth most powerful in recorded human history. In Tokyo, 373 kilometers away, the ground began to roll. Skyscrapers swayed. Some moved over two meters at the top floors. Workers grabbed desks. Elevators ground to a halt. The Tokyo Tower swayed. The antenna bent. But the buildings held. Japanese engineering was being tested, and it was working. In Sendai, the shaking was far more violent. Roads buckled. Power lines snapped like threads. Water mains burst. At Sendai Airport, the control tower rocked back and forth. Planes were grounded immediately. Passengers evacuated onto the tarmac. 2.47 p.m. Japan's early warning system kicked in instantly. An earthquake and tsunami disabled the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Seismologists are trying to figure when the next disaster will hit. Dr. Lucy Jones is a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Dr. Jones, how surprised were scientists by the magnitude of this quake? Well, uh, a mixed bag. Uh, it is a plate boundary. We know that these things happen. But this is the largest earthquake in the last 140 years around Japan. And some of the maps had said they thought that that northern part would never have such a large earthquake. Seismometers detected the P waves, the first faster seismic waves. Alerts were sent out before the more destructive S waves arrived. Trains across the country received automatic stop signals. The Shinkansen bullet trains, traveling at 300 kilometers per hour, screeched to emergency stops. Not a single train derailed. Not one. 2.49 p.m. 
Three minutes after the earthquake began, the Japan Meteorological Agency issued a tsunami warning. Expected wave height, 6 meters. Evacuation orders were broadcast immediately. Sirens wailed along the coast. Families grabbed emergency bags. Elderly were helped into cars. Teachers led students up hillsides. But there was a problem. The warning said 6 meters. Many coastal towns had seawalls 10 meters high. Some people thought they'd be safe. Others were exhausted. They'd just survived six minutes of violent shaking. 3.15 p.m. Kamaishi, Iwate. The first wave arrived. A low rumble, distant, like thunder. Then the horizon changed. A dark line appeared across the ocean, growing, rising, rushing forward. It wasn't a wave. It was a wall, black, churning, filled with debris. It moved faster than a person could run. The city of Kamaishi had prepared for this. They'd spent $1.6 billion on the world's deepest tsunami breakwater. Two massive barriers, 63 meters deep, stretching two kilometers across the bay. It was supposed to stop a tsunami. It didn't. The wave crashed over it, smashed through the gates. Concrete blocks weighing 50 tons were tossed aside like pebbles. The breakwater slowed the wave, bought people a few extra minutes, but it couldn't stop it. The tsunami surged into Kamaishi. Fishing boats were lifted from their moorings, hurled into buildings. Cars were swept off streets, spun like toys. The water was black, thick with mud, debris, oil. It carried everything, trees, refrigerators, roofs, bodies. Tsunami waves reached many of Japan's coastal regions after a strong earthquake near Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula Wednesday morning. The Japan Meteorological Agency is calling on people to stay evacuated until all alerts have been lifted. Survivors who made it to high ground describe this sound, not crashing, not roaring, grinding. The sound of a city being torn apart, metal twisting, wood splintering, glass shattering, and underneath it all, the deep, unstoppable roar of water. 3.20 p.m. Rikuzen Takata, Iwate. Population 23,000. A small, beautiful coastal city, famous for its 70,000 pine trees lining the beach. The tsunami struck Rikuzen Takata with full force, waves over 16 meters high. The entire downtown district vanished in less than 10 minutes. City hall, schools, shops, fire station, hospital, gone. The tsunami didn't discriminate. Wooden homes splintered. Concrete buildings collapsed. The youth hostel, a popular landmark, was swept off its foundation. Only the top floor remained, lodged between trees a kilometer away. Over 1,700 people died in Rikuzentikata. Thousands more were never found. 3.25 p.m. Minami Sanoriku, Miyagi. Population, 17,000. A fishing town nestled in a V-shaped bay. The geography made it vulnerable. The bay funneled the tsunami, concentrated its power. Waves here reached 20 meters, higher than a six-story building. The town's crisis management center stood three stories tall. Inside, Miki Endo was at her post. When the earthquake struck, she immediately began broadcasting evacuation warnings. People heard her voice and ran. Families grabbed children. Neighbors helped the elderly. They climbed the hillside, but Miki stayed. She kept broadcasting, kept warning, kept saving lives. Even as the water rose around the building, even as colleagues begged her to leave, she stayed at the microphone. Her final broadcast was cut short. The building was hit. The tsunami obliterated it. Miki Endo did not survive. 3.27 p.m. Onagawa, Miyagi. The wave here was catastrophic, over 34 meters high in some areas. The second highest tsunami wave ever recorded in Japan. It didn't just flood the town, it climbed the hillside. The tsunami reached elevations over 20 meters above sea level, higher than anyone thought possible. An entire apartment building, five stories tall, was toppled onto its side. Steel reinforced concrete, designed to withstand earthquakes. The tsunami knocked it over like a domino. The building still lies there today, preserved as a memorial, a stark reminder of the ocean's power. 74% of the town's buildings were destroyed. Over 800 people died. 
Survivors who made it to higher ground watched in horror. Some recorded it on their phones. The footage is haunting. You can hear the sobs, the prayers, the disbelief. 3.30 p.m. Sendai, Miyagi. Sendai, the largest city in Tohoku. Population over 1 million. The tsunami surged up the Natori River, pushed inland over 10 kilometers. Farmland flooded, entire neighborhoods submerged. Aerial footage captured the tsunami moving through Sendai's coastal district. It looks like a living flood. The water doesn't crash, it flows, relentless, unstoppable. Cars, trucks, shipping containers, entire houses were swept along. A three-story building floated down the street, intact. Steel-reinforced concrete, designed to withstand earthquakes, the tsunami knocked it over like a domino. Over 50,000 homes were flooded in Sendai. Hundreds of people died. The prefecture was devastated. At Sendai Airport, the tsunami breached the runway. Passengers and staff had evacuated to the upper floors after the earthquake. Now they watched from the windows as the terminal flooded. Planes were swept across the tarmac. Luggage carts swirled in the water. The control tower stood firm, but everything around it was submerged. The airport would remain closed for a month. 3.50 p.m. By now, the tsunami had struck over 400 kilometers of coastline, from Aomori province in the north to Chiba province in the south. Entire towns erased. In some places, nothing remained but foundations, concrete slabs where homes once stood, bare earth where streets once ran. The coastal communities of Tohoku had been home to hundreds of thousands, fishing villages, small cities, agricultural towns. Now they were gone swept into the ocean. The death toll was climbing by the hour, but no one knew the true number yet. Communications were down, roads were destroyed, entire regions were cut off from the outside world. Rescue operations were already underway, but the scale was overwhelming. News of the disaster spread globally. Images of the tsunami flooded television screens worldwide. The footage was unbelievable a wall of water devouring entire towns, fires burning on the surface of the flood, nuclear reactors exploding. It looked like the apocalypse. The international response was immediate. The United States launched Operation Tomodachi, friend in Japanese. 20,000 American military personnel deployed to assist. Aircraft carriers, helicopters, medical teams. They delivered food, water and supplies to isolated areas. Other nations sent aid as well. Even countries with limited resources contributed what they could. The world stood with Japan. In the days and weeks that followed, the full scale of the disaster became clear. 15,899 confirmed dead, 6,157 injured, 2,526 missing, presumed dead. 470,000 people displaced from their homes, 130,000 buildings destroyed, 230,000 vehicles lost. The economic damage exceeded $220 billion, the costliest natural disaster in recorded history.